All right. So uh, the second speaker of the day, it's uh, Coach Kotelniki from Buffalo. Um, again, if you have some question uh, to Coach K, uh, use the Q&A in the bottom of your screen. And um, that's it. So, Coach, it's up to you. Good, Matt. Thanks. Uh, can you guys hear me all right? I hope. Yeah. Matthew, you got me? Okay. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here, guys. Uh, hopefully, you'll be able to see it. Um, again, as uh, Matthew was saying, just go ahead and rifle questions as they come in. Um, hopefully, I can see them. I don't know if I can figure that out. Maybe I'm not that technologically advanced. Um, okay. Anyway, I, I guess what I want to talk about today, um, you know, just generally speaking, going through, I discussed a little bit about our philosophical approach, you know, to, to game plan. Okay. I want to spend a little time talking about execution and defining it. Uh, it is certainly a word that we use a lot in football. And have you ever sat down and really evaluated how do you help your players execute? And uh, we've done that. We've kind of created a little model, which I'll, which I'll share with you. Um, I'll get into a little bit of the game planning paradigms that, that we, we have as uh, offensive and defensive coaches. And then last, I'll, I'll get into how we make football finite. Um, you know, here at Buffalo, okay? And then we'll get into kind of what the call sheet maybe, you know, would look like and how many calls you have on it in the weekly schedule for, for our coaches and staff, okay? I think this is really important to define this right away. And when you talk about being a coordinator of something, okay, I've been, I've been lucky, I've been fortunate. Um, I, I've been an offensive coordinator for, I think, going 15 years now. I've been able to call plays at literally every level of college football. Um, I've coached every level of college football. I've coached every offensive position. Um, you know, and I, I think with that, I get I, that experience brings me some, you know, some perspective on how what you do as an offense affects so many positions and, you know, um, why you do things. But at the end of the day, if you're coordinating something, the, the definition in the dictionary is to bring different elements of, elements of a complex activity organization into a relationship that will ensure efficiency or harmony. And at the end of the day, when you talk about offensive football, I mean, you really do spend a lot of time talking about efficiency. How efficient are we at things? How efficient at how we practice? How efficient are we at that pass scheme or that run scheme? And so that's what a coordinator is. That doesn't necessarily mean you're an unbelievable whatever O-line coach or quarterback coach or, you know, receiver coach or tight end coach, running backs, whatever you would coach, or an unbelievable play caller. I think those are all things that are, that are part of being a great coach. But in terms of what you have to do to coordinate, don't, don't forget those things. You have to create efficiency. And you've got to take things that are complex, and you've got to find a way to make them simple. Okay? Now, uh, I, I put this picture up here in the right um, as I look at it. Every offensive meeting that we have with our players, we start the meeting with this picture. And uh, I, I pull the slide up, and I say, what is it? And our players will, you know, call back. They'll say, it's the difference. And in our program – um, we understand that that is the difference, that little bit right there. Um, I've been fortunate as a coach, like a lot of you, I have been a winner, okay? I've, I've been fortunate to, to win 15 games, never lose a game in a season and be a national championship uh, or a national champion. And I've also had the, the privilege of being one and nine, right? Uh, or two and 10 and everything in between there in the spectrum. And uh, having been a winner and won every game and having been, for lack of a better term, a loser, um, I can assure you that the difference between being 1-9 and nine and being 10-0 and 0 is not nearly as far as some people will make it out. And it really is that much of a difference. In every game and in every moment and within any play, that is usually the difference. One turnover, that happened because somebody wasn't on the same page or didn't execute the technique that you would expect them to, to do, okay? Uh, the second picture here, and I think this is a great illustration of, I, I think, what coordinating is, okay, and uh, like a game plan. I stole this from, um, I went to a cool clinic a few years ago, and the, the, the former O-line coach of the Patriots, Dante Skarnacki, was talking. He, sh he showed this, he showed this front right here, where the, uh, the, the two D linemen are in three techniques and the inside backers walk up in the eight gaps. And, he, and, and it's at the cool clinic, if none of you have ever been there before, it's usually it's a it's a congregation of alignment from all levels of football, professional, college, high school that are there. And there's a let's just say a couple hundred people in the room. And uh, Coach Granacki asked the group, he says, OK, here's the look that you get. How many of you, by a show of hands, would 
just slide your lineman to the right and have your running back pick up the guy on the left. Whatever, a third of the room raises their hand. Then he says, okay, how many of you would have the center slide left, the other four linemen take the man on, and the running back takes the Sam? Another third of the room raises their hand. How many of you would slide the line to the left and free release the back and throw hot off the end? You know, whatever, another handful of hands show up. And he goes, my point is everything that you do is and can be right. And it doesn't matter what you do. It just matters as long as you're all on the same page. And I think that's so critical. I think that that is one of the most important jobs that you have really as a, as a coordinator, a head coach, or whatever you're doing is to make sure that people are on the same page because it all works. Um, how many of our people we have in this talk today, I mean, we've all done things differently, but at the end of the day, is our staff, are our players, are we all on the same page about how we're doing it? How are we doing it at Buffalo? That is the difference, right? That's what separates, you know, me and 15 and 0 and 1 and 10, right? Um, I'll, I want to define this, okay? And I think this is a fantastic quote from uh, Brian Billick. If you don't have this book, I recommend, I don't get any kind of royalty for this. This came out, I think, in the early 90s, developing an offensive game plan. And he spends time talking about Bill Walsh and Brian Billick, of course, worked with Bill Walsh. And he talked about um, how they went about the modern way of game planning. And I use the word modern loosely. Okay. In, in the start of the book, I, this was fantastic. And I had to share it. He, he, you know, he commented, he went, he said, two great coaches or great coaches have two things in common. He goes, one, that they're outstanding teachers, which I full heartedly believe. And then, two, they have a really well-defined structure, which they adhere to when they're preparing their teams. And so when you uh, are training your program in the offseason, your players, do you have a defined structure for when they're going to work out, when they're going to lift weights, when they're going to run, when they're going to, you know, throw and catch balls, okay? And then what kind of teacher are you? Are you, are you up to date in best practices of teaching? Okay, and as older we all get, okay, we understand that the generations below us learn differently. Okay, are you in tune with how they learn? Are you staying in touch with best practices to be the best teacher? And I think that when we spend time professional developing, these are the things that we're always looking for. What kind of job are we as teachers? What kind of job are we doing as teachers? Now, again, I'm going to share this with you, okay? And I've learned the hard way, like I've told you. Everything I'm sharing with you today, I'm sharing because I've, I've messed it up first, okay? I've been pretty fortunate that I was able to coordinate it at a relatively young age and mess a lot of things up. Okay, the structures that we talk about here that you want to stick to and adhere to when you're preparing your team, they can never be so rigid that creativity is hindered. You don't ever want to stymie creativity within your staff or within your, within your players. And it's okay to be creative. And that is how football evolves. Okay, but you can't be this jack of all trades, a master of none. So there's a balancing act that you have to kind of stick to there. But I learned it the hard way. At one point in time, I got so wrapped up in the structures that we were doing and what we did, and this is the way we do it, that all of a sudden, you know, any creativity is gone. It's lost. And then you become, you become stale. And I've also been a part where all you do is be creative and you don't have any structures. Okay? And you need to find a good balancing act there. But I, but I think if you can define some things within your program that you're going to adhere to when you're preparing your guys, you got a chance. Okay? My favorite football quote right here. Okay, Bill Walsh said it. The game of football should never be reduced to the point where you simply blame players for not physically overwhelming the opponent. If you're running a scheme and your left guard is supposed to block this three technique and he can't consistently get that done to help you win the football game, then you don't ask him to do that. If your receiver is not going to be better than that corner who's covering him and you're expecting him to consistently go out there and win one-on-one -on -one and throw the ball his direction, don't do that. You're just, then you're just blaming your players for not physically overwhelming the opponent. So we have to do a good job of helping our kids execute. And this is one of the things I wanted to talk about. We use this word in football all the time. And we don't spend very much time defining what we do to help our kid. Okay? So we, had, we made this little model. Okay? And this is something that's relatively new, okay, for, for us. Okay? If you look at this, okay, to help our kids execute the things that we do as coaches, all right, is that the first – or the top four things that you see here have to do with schemes, okay? Are you doing a good job of stretching out the field horizontally and vertically? I put this picture right here. I don't know if anyone knows what that is. It's called a, it's called a Hoberman sphere. It's that little plastic toy that you can, whatever, you can condense it and then you can expand it. And I talk about distortion in football a lot. It's my, it's my new favorite word, okay, distortion, as it applies to football. 
football is a very simple game. You have to get the ball from one side of that sphere to the other. Now you could physically just move that ball back, okay? You could throw over that ball. Or, as you see in the left here, you could pull it apart and distort it and try to go through it, which is something that we always keep in mind when we're putting together a game plan, is what are we doing to stretch the field out? Now, a lot of you, when I share this, of course, you think about spread offenses or throwing the ball all over the, you know, spraying it all over the field. And I know we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of people on this talk here today from, you know, up in Canada, and the field's quite a bit bigger up there. But, you know, are you stretching it out? Okay. And I understand, or I believe that there's ways to create distortion that don't have anything to do with aligning, you know, in wide splits or spread offenses. Okay. Um, do you have balance in what you're doing? Okay. Uh, uh, this last year, we were really, really good at running the football. And so we were very run heavy offense, uh, which is great for us. You know, I love that. Okay. There's been years in the past where we had to rely on ripping the ball around. Well, why? Well, because one reason or another, we had really good quarterback and receivers and, so you're crazy not to let those guys, you know, sling it around. Um, and then if you're a big throw team, eventually you're going to get in a situation where you're not going to be able to throw the ball. Okay. You can't control mother nature. Um, you might find yourself playing out there in 30 mile an hour winds. Uh, you know, how, how comfortable are you throwing into that? Okay. Um, the, the option football component is big. You know, the modern day option in our offense, at least is RPOs. Okay. Are you putting some sort of option stress on a defense? Okay. And then last, from a scheme standpoint, we talk about multiplicity, being a multi-tempo team, being a multi-personnel team, multi-formation, multi-play family. Okay. So those top four have to do with how you handle things schematically. Now, the bottom six are a little bit more philosophically uh, oriented. Okay. So if you start on the left, are you mastering the mundane parts of your job? And one of the, I use the word mantras in our offense we talk about is remember your training. And are you doing a good job as a coach and as a position coach reflecting on what are you actually training your players to do? Okay, how much are, can you define the fundamentals of your position? And is that list of fundamentals more than one or two pages? If it is, that's way too long. You really got to shave fundamentals down in your position just to, to a handful of things and train your players to do that. Okay, um, I read a book. A long time ago, again, I, I've said this before, um, it was called D-Day. And the book was, I don't know, it's like two inches thick. And it, it's unbelievable because in the first half of that book, it's all about the preparation for D-Day. It's not the actual day of the invasion. It was the preparation for this day when all the Allied forces, you know, invaded Normandy. Okay. And that's a lot like football. And I explained that to our players. I said, we do so much preparation for just one game a week. It's unlike any other sport. And so we have to train ourselves. Well, in this book, it also talked about how, as they're on those, what's called the Higgins boats, the boats that get closer to shore, and they're about to enter hell on earth as we would know it, right, with the bullets flying and, you know, and, and, and people dying and um, just, just off, obviously an awful environment. The commanding officer in all those boats, as that boat's getting closer and closer to the shore, he just kept yelling, remember your training, remember your training, because at the end of the day, and I know this is a special forces quote, it says when, when things are getting stressful, you're not you're going to sink to the level of your training. You're not going to training. You're not going to rise to the occasion. OK, so we that's kind of a mantra to us. And we want to do a good job is making sure that we're training our guys in the right tasks. We want to promote physical football in our offense and on our football team. That's not exclusive to us. So I would urge everyone to say, what are you doing, doing to promote physical football? OK, and I'll say within our program, we do several things, but I'll just share with you being a physical football team can't be just beating the hell out of your kids during the whole week, full pads, every day, talking about how tough we're going to practice and then say we're going to go out there and play tough. I understand that you can't practice soft and expect to play hard. I buy into that too. But you have to keep your kids fresh and ready to be physical when they go up there and play their games on Saturdays, at least for us when we play on Saturdays. Okay? So evaluate what do you do to promote physical football. Okay? For us, it starts with strain and finish. Okay, I think that alone is, is going to get you to be a more physical football team. We want to make sure our guys understand ball security and they demand it of themselves. We want to practice with a purpose. I will spend some time talking about this today. Okay, what do you do to manage the overage in your offense? How many plays are you carrying? Okay, how specific are you with the kind of reps that you're running? All right, are you reflecting on that? Or are you kind of just have this giant menu 
this giant call sheet that you go out there and just kind of whatever you feel like you need to have an answer for everything on your call sheet. Okay. That may be how you do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying I've done that before. It hasn't worked out well for me. Okay. You need to evaluate how aggressive you're staying as an offense and as individuals. And then last, you got to make, you got to make sure you're doing a good job within a game plan of providing opportunities for your players to make a play. And, you know, sometimes you got to let your receiver go out there and make a play against a corner covering him one-on-one or a safety. Sometimes you got to let your running back make a play against, you know, that free hitter. Okay. That extra guy that's coming into the box, however that is. And are you doing a good enough job to, you know, being multiple enough that that's not the same picture for that defender all the time. All right. So I always urge guys. Okay. And I, again, I apologize if, if, uh, if I'm pontificating here, but spend some time about what do you do as a program to help your kids execute. And this is something that we were able to come up with. And when we thought about, okay, what do we do? All right. Okay. Let's get into the game plan a little bit here. There really are two paradigms. Okay. Paradigm one would be worrying about your team, reflecting on what do you do? What do your players do best? What tendencies do you have? How many plays do we have in each situation? How much are we going to practice this? Okay, that's the first paradigm. The second paradigm is your opponent. Okay, what defensive front coverage do they run, right? How much do they pressure? How much, um, you know, what does their personnel look like, et cetera? We're going to talk more about paradigm one today. Okay, I want to spend a lot of time talking about that. Okay, if, um, and again, guys, ask questions as we go through here. If you got something, I don't even know if I can see it. Um, I should know how to see it. Oh, I can hit that Q&A button. I bet that would help. Okay. But, yeah, go, and if, if you got questions, just, just type them in there. Okay. I want to spend time talking about paradigm one here. Um, you can't control number two. What your opponent does, you have zero control over. What you do, what you practice, that's what matters the most. Okay. All right. So when you're thinking about game planning here, you got a couple schools of thought when you're thinking about putting together an offense and how many calls and what kind of offense. And, and um, let, me, let me just go back and talk about this. Part of the reason I, I want to talk about game planning or part of the reason I talk about game planning sometimes is when I'm, when I'm visiting on a, you know, on a clinic circuit, I guess you would say, is it's something that's applicable to all of us. Um, schemes nowadays, you know, everyone's going to, you know, scheme knowledge and understanding is, it's so plentiful. There, there's so much ability for us as coaches to go out there and, um, you know, learn about new schemes and offenses and whatever you want to do plays. Okay. But I, so I want to spend time talking about game planning because I think it's really important. Like I said, what you do doesn't matter. It's more about how you do it. Okay. So you have this less is more model. So this less is more model is that your offensive production will increase when the, your offensive volume is less. And the more offense that you add, the shitter you become as an offensive production team. Okay? This is suited for teams with talent and depth. That's what some people think. Okay? I've subscribed to all these models, by the way, at one point or another in my career. Okay? So you got some teams where it's like less is more. That's the only way we're going to do it, which I get. Okay? Then you have the other side of that coin, which is I need an answer for everything on my call sheet. I feel like as the play caller, I've got to be able to have the perfect call. And uh, I need – my offensive volume is going to increase. That's going to allow my offensive production to increase. Okay? And you might feel that way uh, because you don't feel like you have as much talent. You can't just get let your guy go out there and make a play. Okay? And, again, I subscribed to this model before as well. And now I've kind of fell upon this. I just called it the inverted U model. All right? And there is an art – versus the science of coaching. I really believe that. And I think one of the hardest things to do as a coach is to really determine on a year-to-year basis what you think you're going to, your team is going to be good at, okay, who your opponents are going to be and the things that you're going to need to be good at to attack them. You can say all these things, and, it's, and, I, and I agree, fellas, that at some point, you know, you are going to be who you train yourself to be. I totally get that. I think you need to have a, have enough multiplicity within your offense that if let's say you got a couple of really good tight ends on your team, you should find ways to make sure those guys are playing a lot. If you got some good running backs, same thing. If you got good, you know, receivers, okay, you should have some flexibility that allows you to kind of morph into what your team is going to be like that year, your roster, so to speak. 
And this inverted U model goes to show is that, you know, your volume of offense and your production will kind of, you know, um, linearly grow together. But that at some point, it's going to hit a peak. And if you go past that point, it goes downhill in a hurry. And your offensive production starts to really get crappy. And that's an art form to really identify when that is. And we try to make it a science because we, as we'll get into here a little bit in a second here, we, we try to, you know, we quantify everything. We want to make it finite. As I said before, we want to, how do we make football finite? Okay. I think that's where the science part of it is. But the art form, which becomes, man, are we really going to be able to do all these things with those kind of receivers or those kind of running backs or those kind of tight ends? Uh, and that, you know, I think that probably comes with just experience and really quite honestly, having time to reflect on it. Okay. All right. So here's what a typically year, year cal calendar looks like for us. Okay. And I'm going to try to go through this pretty quick because I got to, there's a time limit here. Okay. I want to make sure I got enough time for questions. All right. So when you get into the typical year, oops. Okay. You have to spend time evaluating what kind of players do you have? How deep are you in each of those positions? Let's say you got two really, really good receivers. What's the depth like behind them? Because now you say we got these two good receivers and maybe we want to be a multi-receiver team. Okay, well, what kind of other players are you putting in the field? What happens if one of those guys get hurt? Okay, this comes up a lot at the quarterback position. Man, we had this unbelievable starting quarterback. He's great. When he runs the ball, he's fantastic. He's a great runner. So you put in all these quarterback runs. Okay, if he goes down, do you have to chop off over half of your offense? And the answer might be yes, and, that, and then you have to understand that that's the risk that you're taking when you go out there and run that kind of offense with that kind of player. And, again, you should do whatever you have to do to get your best players the ball and help them execute, okay? But have some forethought in your mind of saying, okay, what happens if this guy's gone? What happens to our offense, okay? I say the expertise of your staff, and I know this varies from program to program. we got guys on this call right now who are professional coaches, okay, who, you know, or coach the professional, and some guys who maybe are in high school and they're, and they're the only full time coach. Okay. Do, do your, does your staff have a good understanding of what the run game and the pass game is supposed to look like for them? And then how much time do they commit in the offseason? Okay. To getting better at those things. All right. Another thing you got to be asking yourself when the season's over is how much time do you have before your first game to prepare? You know, and obviously with COVID 19 right now, that affected everybody. And so they had to really reflect on what do we have to do to be able to prepare our guys for a season, okay? So do you have spring football? Do you got a camp in the summer? Do you have a bye week that you can use to add extra installation or whatever it is? Spend time evaluating that. And then I think this one's really important, okay? What are the defensive structures of what I would call your must-beat opponents? So when I say must-beat opponents, who are the teams in your league that you like, man, Let's say you're the best team in the league. Let's say you're the reigning champion in your league. But team A, B, and C are always giving you one hell of a game. You should spend time studying the defensive structures of those teams. Because if they're all, let's say they're all a four-man front, okay, those three teams are a four-man front, but the rest of your league is a three-man front, and you're doing all your drawings and you're doing all your fall camp against a three-man front, you better make sure that you're doing a good job of getting your kids ready to play a four-man front, okay? Or maybe it's a zone coverage or some man coverage, whatever it is. Maybe you're a middle-of-the-pack team, and you're trying to beat, you know, those two teams that are just in front of you consistently, okay? Are you doing things to prepare for them and their defensive structure, okay? You, those are things that you can be evaluating right now, okay? Now, uh, so here's what we do. Postseason, in the winter, early spring, we spend a lot of time on our self-scout evaluations. We talk about our personnel, who's coming back, who are we losing, okay, how have they been replaced, is that person growing the way we want, what are we deficient at, okay, schemes, what are we deficient at, what, what, what we called this play way too much and it was really inefficient for us, okay, why, do we still need it, what are we really good at, man, we're good at all these plays, why, well, because that receiver was really, really good, okay, and he just graduated, all right, well, how does that affect us, okay. I know some of these things seem really simple, but I think it's important that you keep in mind of what you're doing because really simple, when you do the simple well, you, you're probably a pretty dang good football team, okay? And then we spend time from professional development. Um, what do I, like as our staff, okay, what do I want to get better at from a knowledge standpoint, okay? What is our, whatever, our, our O-line coach, what does he want to spend time on or our quarterback coach, okay, or our graduate assistants? 
What are they deficient at that we need to get better at? Who do we want to study? Okay. Who do you, you know, whatever you want. We want to study the national championship team this year. We want to study that team that, you know, what, you know, maybe you think and you reflect that, gosh, next year we're going to be really good in 12 personnel. And we haven't ran a lot of 12 personnel lately. Um, let's spend some time studying this team because I know they're in 12 personnel a bunch. What kind of stuff do they do? Okay. And then, and then you study that stuff and you figure that stuff out. Okay. Then I also, like I said, going back to those must beat teams who played those teams. Well, who gave them a hard time? Okay. And then, and then really kind of get into that and, and start to understand um, what you got to do. When we get to spring ball, fellas, we focus on fundamentals and conceptual understanding. That's priority one. Okay. Priority two is personnel adjustments. If we think we have a receiver who maybe can play running back or a running back that can play safety, that's the second priority. We'll let them try that. Okay. The next priority is going to be, we think schemes that are going to be necessary to install. And you got to be very careful to overage. We need this new scheme because it's going to help us beat team A who has consistently beat us year after year. And it's one of the teams that we can beat or that we must beat. Okay. So at least having some good reflection and thought about, you know, why you're putting a play in for us. We're never going to install a new play or a new concept unless we can have a real dialogue and understanding and I guess for lack of a better term, um, convince ourselves to say that we need to be able to do this because it protects one of our core plays. Okay. We don't want it to be kind of a hodgepodge offense. Can you identify what your core plays are? And we can. Okay. And anything that we install should protect one of those plays. Otherwise, we don't need to do it, okay? And then spend time, guys, kind of thinking about what, you know, um, what defensive schemes don't you get repetition against when your own defense plays? The analogy I gave before, let's say your defense plays a 3-4. They're an odd front team. All right, well, all spring and all fall camp, you're going to be practicing those 3-4 double teams. Or maybe they're a man coverage team exclusively or almost exclusively but the teams that you need to beat in your league are more zone coverage, all right? Or they're an over front as opposed to an odd front. Are you spending time to figuring out, okay, how do I get my guys reps of that zone coverage as opposed to man during fall and spring, okay? And that answer, you sometimes you got to get creative with that, okay? Um, sometimes you got to spend a little extra time in individual to get those kind of reps to make sure that those double teams and those, those techniques are getting executed. Um, on, a, on a weekly basis throughout the spring, okay? Then we get in the summer, we look at our spring football cut-ups and our personnel, and then I get into the, the camp installation for preseason and kind of really reflect on, can we be good at what I thought we could be good at after spring football? And then obviously we're going to spend, you know, our non-conference games, our first three opponents, which a lot of times is four for us. Um, we're going we're gonna to break those guys down and kind of do a scout on them, and then we're going to spend time on our top teams in our conference and scout them. That's what we're doing when we're not in season, okay? And then as we get ready for fall camp, you know, obviously we finalize the, the, the you know, camp installation, you know, the playbook stuff, whatever you do for that. Like, I, I, I'm not a huge playbook guy. I think um, technology nowadays, you know, uh, you know most, most people have huddle, and so they do things on huddle. I think kids need to see a drawing of installations, but handing them a playbook, nah, I don't know if that really matters that much anymore, okay? And then when we get to fall camp, we really refocus on the fundamentals that we emphasized all spring. And then we make some personnel decisions and evaluations. Say, okay, this is going to be the starting quarterback, or this is going to be the top three receivers, or whatever it is. By the time camp's over, we want to feel good about what those are, okay? And then identifying that 80-20 rule. And what that is, guys, is that, you know, really you're going to get 80% of your offensive production is going to come from probably 20% of your offense. What is that? What is your base stuff that you're going to get a bunch of yards from, okay, or touchdown? And trying to identify that and making sure you're good at that, okay? All right, so your yearly calendar, okay? So my thing would always be what can you do with your players right now, okay? What can you do during spring football team camp field session when we haven't been able to work with our players, okay? And I know there's even a question if you have a season. How do you stay on top of, you know, keeping your kids – because their default setting is not to do what we're doing here today. Their default setting for a lot of players, at least the college age, is not to 
go to a YouTube clip of, you know, the left tackle pass setting or getting off a press if you're a receiver, whatever it is. Okay. So you have to kind of help guide them and steer them to that in small doses. Okay. All right. So I had an aha moment years ago when we talk about making football finite. Okay. And we're talking about, I understand how much calls go on a call sheet. By that, I mean, in a game, you're probably going to have roughly five third and medium calls. Okay. So third and four to seven. You're going to have about five calls that are that situation. Okay. So the number of calls in the call sheet should have about, you know, 25% over it. So you have six or seven calls on there. But my aha moment was when someone talked about, okay, well, how much do we practice? How much do we practice it? So very similar, like we talked about being a teacher, okay? If I said, okay, you're going you're gonna to teach whatever. You're going to teach world history to eighth graders. All right. The next question you're going to ask me is, well, how much time do I have to teach them world history? How many days a week are we going to meet? How long are the class periods? Okay. From there, then you would develop a curriculum. So as a football coach, we say, okay, here's our offense. The next question is better be, and you better know this, is how much time do we have to practice it? Okay. So you can't go in there and have this huge pile of things that you want to install and then find out that you only have a minimum number of reps to actually practice it. So I encourage anyone to go through on a week-to-week -week basis what a typical practice week looks like. And here's what ours is, okay? Or I shouldn't say necessarily, you know, this is typical. This is through the years, okay? So in our world, minutes equal reps. If you're going to do something for 10 minutes, you should be able to identify how many reps you're going to get in a 10-minute period. And that also helps kind of control the pace of practice, all right? You should be able to define how many 11 on 11 reps do you get. Okay, how many skelly reps, inside run? How many reps does your first team, second team, third team get? How much meeting time do you have on a daily basis? How much walkthrough time do you have? You, have, you want to know how much time you have to teach a subject before you start teaching it. Okay, now from there, so at our 19 season, okay, we typically get 30 reps of our offense versus our defense. You know, good on good reps. Okay. So every Tuesday, every Wednesday, and every Thursday, we're going to do something against each other for 30 reps, which is about 15 on Monday, 15 on Tuesday, and then we do our two-minute drill on Thursday. Now, versus the scout team, we're going to get 168 total reps, Monday through Thursday. Friday is our walkthrough, okay? How many inside or team run reps are you going to get versus scouts? How many skelly, sometimes we'll do team pass, where there's a pressure looks, versus scouts, okay? When we do things, guys, uh, I should say this too. Let me quantify, make sure you understand this. Skelly inside and team versus defense, those are what I call bonus reps for our, for our call sheet, things that we want to overemphasize or get more reps than usual in, okay? If we don't run it in 11 on 11, we're, you know, we're not going to – it's not on the call sheet, okay? If I can't make time to script it, then in my mind I can't make time to call it. And again, I'm talking to you as someone who has messed it up before, and I've done that, and that does not work out very well for us, at least, for, at least where we coach, okay, the place I've been, okay? You might feel, again, you might got to be the person who's got 200 some calls in your sheet, and it works for you, it works for you, okay? Like I said, it all works. Just make sure you have a plan to help make sure your kids are executing, okay? So when we continue to break down our week-to-week -week schedule, or I mean our reps, so our open script, which would be first or second down, we're going to get 120 reps in a week versus the scouts. Third and short, seven reps. Third and medium, 12 reps. Third and eight, 12, six reps. And we'll also do some of our team pass uh, versus pressure. So all your pressure looks, okay? And your third and extra long, we have two reps. When you get into the red zone or the backed up, this is what we do, okay? The high red zone, medium red zone, low red zone, bang, bang, bang. That's how many reps we get. Well, in a practice, okay, when we're backed up, okay, we don't really hardly ever get to truly practice on a weekly basis backed up. That's a decision that we make because we cover the situation. We hit it in fall camp, okay, we talk about, you know, we, maybe we'll get in a walkthrough, but a lot of the calls that we're going to have in that situation are going to come from other situations too, okay? 
your two minute, your four minute. We'll get two drives a week, and the four minute will be just like our backed up in the sense of we're going to have some carryover reps. Certainly, guys, we define those situations and the goals, and you know, we, you know, we'll hit it in a walkthrough, but uh, to actually go out there and practice it at full speed against the scouts, we don't, we don't really have time to do it. Okay, so from there, now you figure out, okay, here's what I'm doing to practice. Here's what my week in practice is. Okay, how many calls get in the call sheet? This is how it's breaking down for us. Or I, should, I should say, how many calls per game last year or average in over the last couple of years? So you look at how many times you actually start a drive, which we call P and 10. That's 12 to 13 calls per game. How many first and second down and less than eight calls do you get? Roughly 31. Okay. Uh, second long, second eight to 12. Okay. Uh, I have a question here. This is a good question here. What percentage of reps do you give for your first team versus your second team? Okay. Versus your third team. Our first team offense roughly gets 60% of those practice reps. Okay. And then our second team would take the other 40% and our third team. Because usually when you talk about your second and third team, those are usually your substitution guys. And they'll sprinkle in sometimes based off of personnel packages or, um, you know, maybe situational things that they, that they rotate in on, okay? Uh, but your first team and your second team quarterback, you got to get those. And I know some guys are 50-50. I know, um, but we just, you know, that's just not how we operate. We want to make sure our first team guys get 60% of those reps, okay? Um, then you can see all the third down calls on there, how many per game that we get, okay, roughly over the couple of years. And so when you do this, and again, I encourage you to go back and look at your seasons, okay, because, you know, maybe in the league that you play out in Canada, Ontario versus Quebec versus, you know, Calgary, okay, I mean, how many, how many third and shorts are you really dealing with? Or maybe, you know, second and short in your, in your part of Canada, okay? How many of that are you actually dealing with? because that should dictate how, you know, the kind of calls that you're making. Low red zone backed up. So at the end of the day, though, for us, people always ask, how many calls do you have? I carry between 90 and 105 calls in the call sheet. And that's everything. If we have a quarterback sneak or a Hail Mary, and those things are, those things are on the call sheet, okay? Because I want to feel good about things that we've practiced. I'm a preparation guy. That's my school of thought, generally speaking. I believe in being prepared. I believe in doing a lot of work during the week to make sure that when situations come up during the game on Saturday that we're prepared and we're trained to do them, okay? Some people aren't necessarily that way. They're kind of a volume, and they, they, they want to be only right on Saturday or on game day. Um, just generally speaking, again, guys, this is just my, my perspective. The team who spends more time trying to be right Sunday through Friday typically has a better chance of being successful on Saturday, okay? Because you've done your preparation. You're not just going to go out there and kind of do things based off a of feel. You also on your call sheet, and I think this is important to talk about, is, okay, what's your list of two-point plays? Okay, how does that look like? What does it look like if you get a penalty and you have to go for two? Happened. We had an eight-overtime game a couple of years ago when at the point when you have to go for two. Of course, they've changed that rule since then. Um, but we took a 15-yard penalty. I forget what the heck happened. Oh, it was an offensive pass interference um, on the first try. And it backed us up. We had to try again from the 18. And you had to have a call ready to go. It's a hard one to make, but you had to have one ready to go. And we did. Okay, last play of the game from the 10, the 20. Okay, last play of the game from your own, you know, your own 30-yard line. What are you, you going to do? How many two-minute calls are you going to carry? How many four-minute calls? What are you going to do when you're ahead by one score with six seconds left in the game and it's the last play? You comfortable running your punt team out there? Or do you have a play on offense? Okay, these are all things that are going to get in the call sheet. All right, let's get into the weekly schedule. Okay, and again, guys, feel free to, to, to chime in with questions as you have them. Okay, so every week, and I do believe this changes every week, Sunday after our game, what's our personnel? Have we had any injuries from the day before that's going to affect what we do? Okay, or do we have any matchup issues this week? You know, we have a, whatever, let's just say this, scenario our right guard is blank you know he's average and the d tackle he's going to go against all week is a draft pick okay how does that affect our offense all right uh, because your team your personnel changes week to week based off of matchups based off of injuries based off of weather okay and you have to be able to reflect that sunday every week we update what are we executing well what are we doing a good job of 
that can hurt the opponent and has shown to hurt the opponent. Okay, then the next question, just like we've said before, how much time do I get to practice this week? Is it a typical week? You know, it's a seven-day turnaround. Or like uh, I know, again, there's some guys in the, in the room who are in the CFL. You know, you guys, all of a sudden, you have one of those long bye weeks. What do you do? Do you practice more? Do you practice less? Okay, is it a short week? We play a, we play a lot of midweek games. All of a sudden, we'll have a six-day turnaround or a five-day turnaround. How does your practice schedule look? Okay, how do you want to modify your practice? Okay, so to, to sit there and figure out, you know, what kind of practice am I going to do this week? And then here's the deal. Okay, we're blessed at Buffalo. We have a beautiful indoor facility that's been done now for just over a year. But some people don't have that. How is weather going to impact your practice this week? It's going to be hot as hell. Are you, do you want to be out there the whole time? It's going to be cold as hell. Do you want to be out there the whole time? Do you want to practice being miserable? Okay, those are things that you have to figure out and evaluate on a week-to-week -week basis. And then, again, how much overage do I need to carry in a week? If we're not running the ball as well as we think, do I have enough throw game and a diverse enough throw game to continue to move the ball or vice versa? What happens if we go out there and we're expecting to rip the ball around everywhere and we get out there and it's like sideways sleet rain? Do I have enough offense for when the weather is really crappy? And what happens, like we said before, what happens if this running quarterback that we, you know, we rely on to get 70% of our yards, all of a sudden he goes down? Does our call sheet just get ripped in, you know, thirds? Or what does that look like? And, and sometimes the answer to these questions aren't, <laughs> they're not necessarily good. But you at least in your mind have an idea or a plan for when it occurs, and it will occur so that you're not in some sort of panic mode. And you're not stuck sitting there after the game going, man, I really wish if I would have just had this extra run play on the call sheet for when I knew that that weather was going to be like that, we could have maybe, whatever, picked up that last first down to see the win. Whatever it is, okay? But I think these are things that you want to reflect on week to week. Here's what we do. So here's our day by day, okay? I'm going to try to rip through these here, okay? First of all, Sunday. Okay, our self-scout stuff goes in there. So all of our, our graduate assistants, and we have some other analysts and quality control people that help us. Um, we're blessed, guys. We have a really good offensive staff, by the way. Um, all the, all, you know, between our graduate assistants and our full-time coaches, and, and uh, we're able to get a lot of stuff done because I got a lot of experts that I get to work with every, every week. So um, Sunday, the self-scout data gets put in there. Okay, so you put your data in there. You're looking for, obviously, your tendencies, but you're looking for your efficiencies, you know, and I, I think it's really important, and I don't want to uh, go off on a little sidebar here, but, you know, you call that one screen play the first game of the year and it pops for a 60-yard touchdown on a third and 10, okay? And you call that same screen play the next four, week, four or five weeks, and it's a gain of zero, it's a minus one, incomplete pass, gain of two, incomplete pass, right? Whatever it is. But in your mind, you still go, you know what, man, we're a hell of a screen team. Because in your mind, you think of that one play that went for 60. But really, on a week-to-week -week basis, you, it's, that's not an efficient play for you. You had one explosive play, all the rest were, were really inefficient. Okay? And you don't know that information unless you have some self-scout data. Okay? Uh, every member of our staff will review and grade the previous game by themselves. If I were dealing with maybe a more younger, inexperienced staff, or um, if our staff was brand new together, we would watch it as a staff. Now, we're pretty lucky because we get a bunch of spring practices. We get a bunch of fall camp practices. And I, we can sit in rooms together after every practice and watch film together, which we do. And so you get a good understanding of, you know. And, again, it's all about making sure people are on the same page. And so something will come up, and the O-line coach and the tight end coach need to be on the same page about how they're going to handle that block, that double team, okay. Or the receiver coach and the quarterback coach are on the same page and in their rooms about the depth of that route or whatever it would be, okay? Or there's a protection issue that the back needs to be involved in, all right? So you can answer those questions and make sure that you are on the same page uh, a lot through fall camp and, um, you know, uh, spring football. If you haven't had those opportunities to do that, then I think you need to watch the film together, okay? Uh, because, again, we're a preparation team, so we don't want to be going in there on Sunday saying we wish we would have been on the same page about that. That's a big mistake, I think, as professionals we can't make. All right? Um, and then we're going to get into the, the opponent film. Okay? So we'll have our scouting report introduction will be given to us from our graduate assistants 
right after we get done kind of talking about the previous day's game and our, and our whole staff has met, the head coach has given us his thoughts and we've given him ours, those kind of dialogues, um, we get into it. Okay, and the next opponent, here's the record, here are their stats, here are their personnel, here is, you know, this DN's an All-American, this DN's a projected first-round draft pick, this corner's in the top three draft pick, whatever it might be. Um, we get that information. Then we watch the last three games of that upcoming opponent as a whole staff. I should say offensive staff. And we get on the same page and make sure that the coverages were getting broken down the way we want them to be broken down in the front. And maybe we see this exotic pressure and we're on the same page about, hey, this exotic pressure. Um, okay, here's, we're on the same page about how we're going to pick this up. Okay. And then we immediately get into game planning for our low red zone. Um, we're a Monday practice team. So we have to go out there and be prepared. Sunday's the day off for our players. We have to go out there and be prepared to have a practice Monday morning. And one of the best things that we've done recently is to start our game planning for our low red zone right away. Why do we do that? Usually, traditionally for me, that has been done in the, later in the week. Well, it's an important part of the field, number one. And then number two, it is a very finite and a very specific part of the field. Typically, a defense is going to be what they are when you get inside the tent. You know, maybe they're a cover zero, knockout pressure, you know, team. Maybe they're a, you know, drop off and they're a bracket coverage or the old picket fence cover seven, whatever. I know in Canadian football, you guys got those big old end zones, um, which probably changes it quite a bit. Uh, maybe it's not as specific for you, but in the States, it's very condensed and it becomes a very specific set of run plays or pass plays, okay, that – um, hopefully you can tie over into what you do in the normal down and distance, but there are certain things that you feel like, you know, they're not a big man coverage, cover zero blitz team out of the normal field, but all of a sudden down inside the 10, they are, what are your man beaters then? Okay. And you can have that discussion. You put that plan together. What we do before we go home every night, because I do not, uh, th this is important. This thing that's underlined. The most important thing that we do as coaches is prepare for practice and meetings. Okay. Your practices and your meetings need to be efficient and they need to be the best that they possibly can be. If your GAs or whoever draws your scout card or whoever does your scripting is scrambling to get that done before they go out to practice, typically you're not doing the best job that you can of getting being prepared for that meeting or practice. So before we go home every night, we will script and card the next day's practice. Okay. Because we, I don't want to scramble to do that. Okay. And I don't, I don't think that's fair because you find yourself making mistakes. Okay. Now the next morning when we, before we have our meetings in practice, we get together as a whole staff and we review the script and it takes about 45 minutes, sometimes less than, and we go through every script and every defensive look that we're going to get that day. And we're, and, and I, and I will tell you, it's my favorite meeting of the day because inevitably every time we have that meeting, something comes up where we're, we weren't on the same page, but now we are. Here's this pressure. Well, what's the quarterback going to check here? Uh, he needs to make this call. Oh, yep. Okay, great. And that means the back's got to take this guy and the tackle's got to take that guy. Okay. We also have scout meetings with our players on Monday uh, while we're having position meetings so we can help our scout team get the same page about who we're about to play and who they're trying to make, you know, look for us. Okay. After practice, we'll watch that film and we're going to come in together as an offensive staff and we are going to review that practice film. We're going to immediately start watching all the formations as a whole offensive staff. I love doing it as a whole staff. I know some people divide and they split up. And then the quarterback and receiver coach work in the pass game. And the O-line coach and the running back coach go over and work on the run game. I don't like that. Well, I shouldn't say that. I've done that before. It, it works, you know, a lot of different ways. But what I really like is selfishly, I love using the experience and the knowledge of the staff that I have, okay, that I get to work with. If I lock myself in a room and I come up with all these thoughts and ideas that are my own, and then six hours later, someone comes to me with an idea that might be a little bit different, I'm a lot less likely to adopt that idea. So I'd like to meet together so that as, you know, ideas and thoughts and ways to attack this team or things that we need to do, that I'm involved in those discussions from the ground level. Because then if it, and they all, it all makes sense. It all works. But when it's a really good idea, then we can all feel like it's our idea because we can get on the same page about it, grow together. That might not always be the most time efficient, but I think it's the best way to do it. Okay. And then again, so we do all that stuff. Okay. Um, 
We watch all that. We put that stuff together. We obviously chop down that list to make it finite. And, you know, hey, do we really need to have 20 different ways to run inside zone? No. Okay, let's trim this and make sure that we have the right number of calls. Do we really need to have, you know, 20 different play actions? No. Okay, which ones make the most sense that fit to our running game? And we have those discussions to whittle things down. And then, again, we divide up who's going to script what on uh, the next day. And then everyone goes in their office and they script and they card up the looks that we're going to see that night before they go home. Okay. And then of course, what do we do the next morning? Because Tuesday and Wednesday are the same. We have that meeting before we have our meetings with our kids as an offensive staff and we review that script. Okay. And then we practice it and then we watch that film. And then we go to third downs on Tuesdays. Okay. We watch third and one, and then with third and two and three and et cetera. And we sit there and we put together those calls. Okay. And then we divide up, okay, what did you script on Wednesday? What am I scripting on Wednesday? Okay, give us the looks, give us the pictures. And the next morning we come in and we review that script again. And then we go out and practice it. Okay, and then we watch that film. And then after that, on Wednesdays, now we get into two-minute is what we do a lot on Wednesdays. Okay, I like to do four-minute backed up possession and 10 and second long by myself because those calls usually all come off of what I would call the open script calls that we already made. Okay. And I openers, okay, I love getting staff input in the openers. So I have all the offensive coaches send me the 15 plays and how they would open the game, okay? Um, and what I look for is I look for carryover. So if four of our five full-time coaches, you know, or let me, this happens a lot too. If five of our five full-time coaches say that they have these three plays in their first 15, we better call those three plays because there's a reason that all the coaches feel that way, Okay. If it's four or five, you know, or three of the five coaches, or maybe it's just one of the five, I maybe I'll sit there and I'll think, I'll go to myself, why does that guy like that play? Why is he the only one who put that in his first 15 plays? You know, and I didn't even ask him. I said, why did you put that play on there? And he might give me an answer that I haven't thought about. And so I get some input from the coaches and say, okay. And from there, we make a kind of a good little list of plays that I think the whole staff likes, which inevitably kind of becomes our top 30 or 40 plays that probably get called, okay? And then again, before we go home Wednesday, we script and card. Next morning, we come in, we review that script, we have our meetings and we practice, we watch that film. And then Thursday afternoon, you know, organizing the call sheet. Um, that's what I'm doing. Um, you know, I'll meet with the quarterbacks in there at some point and kind of just get there. I'll, I'll do this too, by the way. I'll have our quarterbacks give me their 15 openers too. And for the same reasons and say, so you start to, you know, as they get older, they start to think a little bit more about like how, how a coach would. Okay. Uh, there, there's Thursday. We do tests every week for our kids, which I really like, you know, tips and reminders uh, for Friday. So our coaches are organizing that. And then Friday we have that walkthrough that we do, you know, like a lot of people do the day before the game we make sure the call sheet's printed and everyone's got their test out. And then I put together what's called a Friday tape. Um, where, you know, it's kind of, we meet as a whole offense. We all get on the same page about, um, you know, pictures that the defense is going to give us. Okay, gentlemen, that's my email address on there. Okay, my Twitter handle. Uh, I, I certainly for sure would love to give, uh, hear any questions that people maybe would have. Um, maybe there's none because I did such a fantastic job explaining it. Um, but I see there's 64 people on here. So fire away, fellows, if nobody has any. I would have thought for sure I'd get something from Paul Charbonneau, but I guess not. You can't type fast enough. That's the problem. Hey, are your openers all first and 10? Or are they mixed anticipated gains? Uh, and, uh, uh, that's a good question. So at the end of the day, unless that first down call gets us in a second and like 13 or plus, I'll take any second down and treat it as a kind of a normal down and distance, if that makes sense, Sharby. Um, so any first or second down for the most part gets called off of that list of openers. And then when you get into a third down, okay, so let's say the third play of the game is a third and six, we'll organize the opener – or excuse me, we'll organize the third down just like we would openers. Here's our favorite third and medium call. Here's our second favorite third and medium call. You know, here's our first – third and long call here's our second third and long call and then at least you have a plan to how you're going to attack those guys on third down um, as opposed to being totally reactive or calling a play on third down that really doesn't make any sense you know on third and ten 
Does that answer your question, Charby? Yeah, it does. Thank you, sir. Yep. Any other questions? All right. This has so, been great, uh, Coach. Yeah. Uh, I appreciate everyone who's been on here. Um, you know, uh, Canada's been really good. We, we have a great relationship with that university at Buffalo. With, with the, We've had a lot of Canadian players on our team. They've all been really successful. So I uh, appreciate everything you guys can do. If there's anything that we can do, please reach out. Don't hesitate. Okay? All right. So, okay. once again, thanks, Coach, for your time. Uh, my pleasure. Everyone have a great summer. Hopefully we'll see you all in the fall. I hope. All right. Thank you, Coach.